Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chantal Morve Adams. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white cisgendered middle-aged woman with long bangs, wearing a stormtrooper headphones, wearing a colorful scarf. I'm zooming in from the unceded stolen ancestral territory of the Sanaimo First Nation. I have the great honor of living in the shadow of Dr. Lan, grandmother to the surrounding mountains. When I heard the story, uh, to, I, when I first heard this story, um, it was with a, a storytelling session with Elder Florence James, and it really hit my heart because uh, my grandmother is one who helped raise me. Uh, she's the one who I think of when I need strength. Um, she was a strong woman who went through a lot of adversities in her lifetime. She was a matriarch of our extended family. And though she passed um, six years later, I still ask her sometimes, you know, what, what should I do? And sometimes she answers and sometimes she doesn't. I think about my own ancestors in past, some who never lived in Canada and some who were settlers and colonizers back in the 1600s, right up to present day. I look into the past of the footprint my ancestors left, what I am leaving now, and what my children will do in the future. And that leads me to one of my other passions in life, and that is being on the board of directors for PC at Access. We're an organization that advocates for equitable access to education in whatever form works best for the child. You can look us up on BC at access.com, and there will be a link down below. We champion support children and youth who have disabilities and are complex learners to reach their full potential in BC education and in all aspects of their lives. This is achieved through supporting families, sharing information, providing education to families, allies, professionals, and students, providing community engagement and awareness, and other activities to promote equitable access to gate, education and inclusion for all. Education, as we know, is a colonial system it continues to actively harm Indigenous peoples disproportionately. We will support and amplify Indigenous efforts to decolonize education and other systems. So today I'm here with Ramona Shirt, um, and this interview with her is to elevate and highlight Indigenous stories, not just as it pertains to Indigenous Disability Awareness Month, which is this month, and we'll have a link to um, some great folks who are um, BCNs who will be doing some great workshops uh, this month as well. Um, but this is also around the necessity for daily advocacy. Folks need to hear more of these stories of intersectionality so that we can join hands and lift each other up. So I ask you all to come to come with us on this journey um, and to hear from Ramona Shirt. She's an Indigenous mother with disabilities, with two amazing children. One of them has a disability as well, and the other who's on a wait list for Sunny Hill for an assessment. And it's been quite a few years from what I hear. <laughs> Ramona. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. If you can uh, introduce yourself, um, yeah, let us know a little bit about yourself there. Okay, Tanse Nia Ramona Shirt Treaty Six Ochinia Maka Miigwech Coquitlam First Nation. So I said hello. My name is Ramona Shirt. I come from Treaty Six territory, but I now gratefully reside on the stolen lands of Coquitlam First Nation, as well as the traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Kots, Katsi, Musqueam, Squamish, and Kaykite First Nations. I use the pronouns she they. And I am happy to be here and to share my story with everyone. But I say my name is Ramona Shirt, but my last name is actually Chodziki. It's a, we don't, I don't know where that name came from. Um, my dad was part of the 60 Scoop and the 60 Scoop is where the Canadian government from the 1960s to the late 1980s came and took Indigenous children from their families and placed them in foster homes. So my dad never got the chance to find his birth mother or father, and we just have this random name. But Shirt comes from my great grandmother, who was a fighter and activist. And hopefully, I'm making her proud. <laughs> I think you are. I think you are. Thank you. <laughs> so Ramona, uh, you introduced yourself. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your children? Uh, I, I had heard that you had moved from Alberta to BC. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, so I moved from Al Edmonton, Alberta to British Columbia in two September 2019. I moved for a better life for me and my kids because although I have a lot of family at, back home, um, there's a lot of hurt and a lot of everyone's dealing with their trauma in different ways. And <clears throat> I just think it's healthiest. If I love them so much, but from a distance and I just won't need to find my own path. And um, I listen to a lot of meditations and one of my favorite um, people, Tamara Levitt, she said on one of her posts, she said, I traded security for growth. And I relate to that so much. I traded the security of full-time employment, um, specialized schooling, childcare, respite. Um, I don't have any of that here, but at the same time, these past over two years, I've grown so much and I really wouldn't have changed it, even yeah. though I'm now homeschooling my son. <laughs> right. Um that we will get to in a moment. And you, you said that you had a bunch of things in Alberta and you don't have them here. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly did you have in Alberta? So uh, in Alberta, my son was in a specialized school with a smaller classroom there. I think there's about six or seven kids in there and about four adults, the teacher and three EAs, which was great. Um, I had respite where as respite here, uh, there, it's over a seven year wait list and we're pretty much we're just waiting for people to age out of the system when you know there's a lot of special needs parents and caregivers not not even parents but a lot of caregivers that do need access to respite to be um to help their community you know what I mean yeah to to be the best person they can be yeah yeah. You know, we all need that break. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we need specialized services for our mm -hmm. children because we can't just pick, you know, a babysitter down the street. It's got to be somebody who's uh, specialized, yeah. um, who understands our children and their disability, yeah. for sure, yeah. for sure. So yeah. when you came to BC, there was none of that. So when I came to BC, I put my son in public school and right off the bat, the first week it was aggression kicking every day I honestly felt like in my heart that the school wasn't prepared for him or really what to do with him like I went into my first IEP meeting and I sat down with the teacher and the teacher looks at me she said I don't really know what to tell you I don't really see your son that often I was like oh I don't know what I'm doing here um so the aggression start started to get progressively worse to up until so September 27th is when I took my son out of school for good because the behaviors has gotten so bad where the last day I picked him up from school he was punching himself in the face pulling his hair screaming throwing himself on the ground trying to kick other kids and I just I was so fed up I said I'm not bringing him back here yeah and and as you said with a supported classroom before there was none of these behaviors none and the thing is, and i've advocated for behavioral support for my for inside of the school i was denied i of course. yeah tried to work with school a lot whereas now they're doing what they can whereas when i took him out of school this time they opened a whole new resource room last month for children with special needs so there's a, they've created this new space but I still don't feel comfortable sending my son to school because in those I've advocated very hard for a behavioral log and the behaviors are being logged, but the ones at pickup, like the complete breakdowns where he's self-harming, none of those were logged. So I'm thinking if they're not logged, when I'm picking them up, when else is he doing this? Like, I don't really know what's no. going on. And, and what they say is he has autism. That's his way of communicating, but I don't think that's... <sighs> It's, I'm just so tired of hearing that. It, it, well, it's a very ableist statement, right? It's to say mm -hmm. like, oh, well, this is how they always are. That's an assumption yeah. about a disability. Yeah. And it's yeah. it, it's a wrong assumption. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, when people are dysregulated and they're not supported, mm -hmm. they are yeah. going to have feelings and emotions about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the only way that they can communicate that. Yeah. Um, so we really need to like use behavior as communication rather than, yeah. um, you know, 
as as sort of like an intentional uh, uh, disturbance. I, I just mm -hmm. yeah, it's so ableist that idea of that. Um, I'm wondering what is the impact this has had on your life? Um, just to touch back with the schooling. Oh, yes. Quickly. Yes. So uh, we have a, a, our social worker. So I called him and I told him that I took my son out of school and his first response, not a question, but more of your next step is to get him on medication. I, my blood was boiling. I was so angry. I'm like, and it makes me uh, right away. I told him, no, I'm like, I'm not, if that's what inclusive education is, is getting my son high on meds or whatever, like what kind of inclusion is that? <clears throat> but it makes me so angry that he didn't ask me to do it. He was more telling me this is the next step. So we pro we have like a lot of immigrants here in Canada where this is what he's telling them. And, you know, and that's what they're doing. And it breaks my heart. Right. And social workers don't have a medical background. So there's no way that they have any kind of uh, education or anything in regards to medication and what would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, that is up to the medical professionals and the family. That is a very yeah. personal, personal choice. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's unfortunately not shocking, unfortunately. Uh, I, I hear that a lot. I hear it from counselors, teachers, uh, people who really shouldn't be making statements like that, making those yeah. statements. Yeah. And it just uh, makes us trust them less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's not, that's not good. Um, what would you say, like, uh, I did hear that you um, are becoming an EAA. You're, right? Can you, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm working to become an educator assistant um, simp because there is a lack of childcare. Also, there's a wait list on child development. I was not a oh, this is so there's a huge wait list for childcare for my son. Also, so I learned that right away. So our first year here, I quit the job I had. I was working at a group home with people with de developmental disabilities, and I also was working at um, a homeless shelter. But I learned quickly right away that childcare wasn't going through and so I ended up cleaning for a year and doing it while my kids were in school because I wasn't about to go back to Alberta I'm going to make it work here I would feel like I should not be bound to a province so I cleaned and I figured getting into the school district getting the same uh, hours as him I'm passionate about um, advocacy kids with disabilities so I thought it was perfect and I feel like I can make a good change within the school system there. So I'm really excited about that. I'll be done the end of December, but now having to homeschool my son and not feeling comfortable at all to send him back to school. I really, we're kind of in the unknown right now. In the unknown. That's what happens, right? When we have to pull our children and homeschool them, which mm -hmm. many, 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 many families are doing now because yeah, I think the percentage is something like 25% of uh, distributed learning, online learning, uh, homeschooling, 25% uh, have children with disabilities. And mm -hmm. that is an overrepresentation um, in the homeschooling um, online learning system. That's mm -hmm. just, that's a big red flag, I think. <laughs> um, you had mentioned in our first meeting that you had experienced racism in the school system as a child. Um, would you yeah. be comfortable sharing that experience? I am more than comfortable sharing this experience because I feel like it's so important for people to know because a lot of people still think that these residential schools and this racism happened a long time ago. But it was in 1996 when they closed the last residential school. And in 1996, where was I? I was an Indigenous student in grade three, um, forced to step on a stepper and look out a window while my peers played outside. I, um, I got held back from class a lot and had to write lines because I couldn't see the board and I was um, denied access to the bathroom and had to pee myself on a couple occasions in front of the class. So my relationship with this, obviously like growing up, my relationship with schooling was never the greatest. No, and and like that, uh, would you say that um, has 
I mean, I, I, I think we can both agree that that is, has impacted um, your experience and how you now advocate for your own child within the system. Uh, could mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit more about that? So yeah, it affects me a lot. Um, like when I enter a room with, in a, in a school, it's not a lot of indigenous people. It's more of the pale skinned. And I'm nervous usually when I talk to them. I have severe social anxiety from going through what I went through. And it's really difficult for me to advocate for myself and to advocate for my son and to advocate for every tiny little thing that he needs when I'm so burnt out and I'm not getting any support. It's just hard. It really is. And I thank you for sharing that because uh, so many have experienced it as well. And um, it's hard to tell that story, uh, to tell the world, and but people need to know. They need to believe these stories as well, that these things happen mm -hmm. and still do mm -hmm. continue to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's up to us uh, as allies to, to recognize that when we're mm -hmm. walking into a school as well, that mm -hmm. there are those who have who are uncomfortable being there, who have had horrible experiences. Um, mm -hmm. Like, how would you say the school system has changed since you were a child? How, do you feel like it's really changed or do you feel like it's gotten worse, better? I mean, hard to I say. Mean, but I feel like it's changed a lot compared to residential schools. We're not, you know, doing the unthinkable anymore, but we are still excluding a lot of kids from get, having access to education. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we've still got a huge problems in the system, don't we? Yeah. yeah. So what is it like for you as an Indigenous person with disabilities navigating the system? Um, it's pretty difficult to navigate the system, especially the autism funding system. Like, there's just so many systems to figure out. Uh, and having like I having social severe social anxiety, I'm constantly fearful of what people think of me or what people are saying about me, even though it's completely or these completely irrational fears. So writing emails could could take a lot out of me, and it's it seems like su su such an easy thing for someone to do is just go go quickly go get respond to some emails, but to me it's like. I have to sit down, I have to breathe, I have to see, say exactly what I want. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. It's, it, it takes longer. And then, yeah, like you said, all the systems, you, you've got like CYSN services, mm -hmm. there's, you know, regular MCFD sometimes, there's health, there's education, all these different systems um, intersecting with all of that. Um, what is it like for your child being Indigenous with disabilities experiencing the systems? Um, what supports are they getting outside of the school system um, that could help them? So being Indigenous with disabilities and navigating the school system has been, uh, well, our story specifically has been quite difficult. But one thing that we found a lot of um, healing in is learning our language is and learning pre mm -hmm. and i feel kind of like it shouldn't be all on my shoulders you know like the school should offer like some more cultural um opportunities for children to learn their language to like beading and whatnot and stuff like that and that's what i think anyways that is very true. Some schools are now offering that. And uh, there's a really good article uh, by Joe Crona that I'll, I'll reference later on uh, for those mm -hmm. listening that makes a really, uh, that clarifies uh, what uh, it is to be beyond a culturally responsive education and, and having children be connected with their culture. Um, mm -hmm. and not just those children, but all the other children as well to what we to our history here and, and who everybody is in this beautiful province. Um, 
So what do you need from the systems, from the community to improve things for you and your family? In Let's say perfect, top, top three asks. Yes, perfect world. Top, in a perfect world, I'd be able to send my son to school without worrying about his environment, without worrying about his behaviors. I would have childcare. I would have respite. I would be working full time. I love, I'm passionate about my community. I love giving to my community. That's what I was doing in Alberta. I was a community engagement coordinator. I was working for a crime prevention organization and I absolutely loved it. So I was going from compiling resource lists and being very active in the community and like uh, working alongside MLAs and doing all these beautiful initiatives for our community to feeling like com I'm completely excluded from my community now. Yeah, so it's the connectedness that mm -hmm. needs to improve too. Yep. Really good point, really good point. And I hear that uh, you're learning Cree with your sons yes. um, that you mentioned earlier. I think this really great, I, I hope that that can expand too. Yeah, thank you, it's, it's really healing for us. I'm glad. Um, you mentioned in an early conversation that you had done a survey of the disability community. Could you share what that was about and what you learned from that? So in last year in 2020, I was having a hard time with the school. And so I decided to put a survey out on the BC at Access Forum and the Special Needs Forum in BC. And it was uh, titled Parents of children of school age children with disabilities. And in that survey, I don't, the majority of special needs parents feel excluded from their community. The majority of special needs parents are, don't have access to respite. They're, they feel like they're not receiving the same supports in school and they're feeling too burnt out to advocate for themselves or for their children. And I really relate to all of it. I relate to it to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 a uh, we call it it's a, it's an epidemic. It's a crisis mm -hmm. in our system, and uh, that's why we're doing the the protest uh, on the twenty fifth. Um, that jumps off from the twenty fourth uh, protest, and then we're going to have uh, the disability uh, protest. Um, uh, on December 3rd, which is the day of disability. Um, um, the day of disability is December 3rd. So uh, we hope that everyone can join us on these days. And we're going to have actually eight days of action after the 25th. Um, each day, we're going to have live conversations um, or teach ins. Um, learning about the different aspects and the, the complexities of the interconnected systems that we are all dealing with because we don't just deal with education it's it's mcfd it's ministry of health it's ministry for social family development or social housing and development i think is what it's called uh, those things are all interconnected they're all weaving in um and unfortunately, a lot of them are not anti-racist. They're not anti-oppression. Um, they don't have anti-oppression policies in place. So unfortunately, uh, they're just doing more and more harm. So we really need to get the word out there that these things need to change. And I'm so happy you did that uh, survey just right on the money. That's how we all are all feeling. And I think with all mm -hmm. the announcements lately of what's been happening has just hit us all really hard. It, all these changes happening all at one time without what we feel is meaningful collaboration with mm -hmm. the proper representation at the table. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't even think they've even looked at the intersectionality of different identities. Uh, folks who are indigenous, folks who are immigrants, folks who uh, black, people of color. I just, I, I don't feel like LGBTQ, uh, I feel like they've missed a huge portion here, like this big blind spot uh, that we're not connecting with. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Ramona? What do you think? There's that quote where it's, um, how does it go? It's like, to represent us, you kind of have to include us. Nothing about us without us. Yeah, nothing about us without us. That's what yeah, it is. That's the self-advocacy saying, and 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Everybody needs to be at the table mm-hmm. and they all need to be heard and listened mm-hmm. to and their stories mm-hmm. believed. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like we, we tell stories, we say our experiences, but it's sort of like, oh, that's just a one off or that didn't really happen or it was not like really that bad or something. Right. That that gaslighting that happens every time we tell our stories. Yeah. And the main the main thing people tell me when I tell them my story of how it's been here, the main thing people ask me is, why don't you just go back? Why don't you just go back to Alberta instead of asking like, why aren't those supports in place for you to be an active community member? Mm -hmm. Right. That's what we should be asking. Yeah. That's what we should be demanding. Mm -hmm. Disability rights are human rights. Exactly. They are. It really has to change. And thank you for so much for sharing your story, sharing your perspective on this as well. People need to hear that. And uh, I'm really glad that we could we could uh, amplify that voice. Uh, thank you so much, Ramona, for interviewing with us, uh, for talking with us. I hope everybody here has learned something new. Uh, we will have some links uh, in the comments, or I'm not quite sure how they're going to put that in, technologically speaking. I'm not the tech person here. Uh, but we will be putting on some some stuff, uh, some videos as well that Ramona created uh, that she's willing to share with us. Uh, we're going to be uh, sharing um, a, a, an article that I really think uh, is hugely impactful. I started reading it this morning and I was just like, this is exactly what needs to be said. And it's called uh, Beyond Culturally Responsive Education by Jo Crona. She is an Indigenous education consultant with over 25 years experience in the K-12 and post-secondary systems in British Columbia. She has been a classroom teacher, policy analyst, curriculum developer, and resource writer. And you can read more about her and this article that she wrote for the University of British Columbia. Uh, we'll have that link in the comments below. Um, I would like to just sit here and read out that whole article for everybody, um, but I, I will I will not do that. <laughs> but um, the BC ANS, uh, it's British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. They are running workshops this month for the Indigenous Disability Awareness Month. Uh, they are a fantastic uh, society to follow. There's a bunch of resources there as well uh, for people with disabilities and people who want to learn more. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, our little our little website bc at access.com is uh something that uh, people can come and learn more about what we do thank you Sounds so great. much Ramona, for being with us uh for helping us um i know you're going to be getting on board with all these protests that are coming up and stuff like that so we're super looking forward to that and having your voice uh heard I'm thank you Have a- i'm excited too it's going to be good these next couple of weeks are going to be yeah <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> we mean this not in, in a metaphorical way <laughs> yeah, we're, hit the yeah we're going for it now we're yeah. we're done i think we really need to just have our it needs to be taken seriously now thank you and thank you all for watching and listening um and we hope you join us again for our next interview i'm not quite sure who that's going to be but it's going to be somebody awesome again thank you everybody so uh, we, you know, we ended our interview, uh, we started talking about things and, um, I feel like this part of the conversation that we've had really needs to be added to the interview that, that we've discussed. People need to hear this. Um, this is happening to a friend of mine right now. This is happening to a lot of people. And I think that this needs to be heard of how this, so this, this impacts your life, like pulling your child out of school to homeschool. How has this impacted your life? Um, in, in other ways. Well, now that I'm homeschooling, I am, I won't be able to work now. So I have my son full time. So I'm not going to be able to afford our house to afford any extracurriculars, anything really. So we're kind of in the in between right now, we don't really know what's going to happen. And unfortunately, that's how it is for a lot of special needs parents that, and especially single special needs parents, have to, are opting out of the school system and have, are going on social assistance so they can keep their child regulated at home. Keep them safe. 
at home, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you had mentioned your when you first moved from Alberta, two of the horrible, horrible places that you <laughs> had to rent out. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so for the the first place I rented from the landlords were super sketchy. They told me there's cameras in the trees that they're watching me. I have no idea why they would say these things. Um, but with me, with my social anxiety and someone's telling you they're watching you, like my, uh, I was so uncomfortable at, that I, I stayed at that house for six months. So then I found another rental. I moved after our six months lease. I found another rental and it was kind of the same thing, but 10 times worse. They ended up actually harassing us and just being horrible. My babysitter wasn't even allowed to come over anymore because they would stomp on the roof and they would stare at them and like just make them feel completely uncomfortable. So the housing situation itself has been pretty terrible, eh? Like finding a home. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I moved three times in the past three, three times in the past two years, which is so frustrating because I came here to better myself. I came here to like find stability, like do everything for my kids. And it sucks that I have to build myself up from someone's basement who doesn't want me there feeling completely uncomfortable because, you know, we like Indigenous people were excluded from the economic system. You know, we're all starting up from scratch. I'm 33 years old. I'm in post-secondary right now, you know. I'm not ashamed of it, but that's a lot of Indigenous people are, which is great. So if any Indigenous people are seeing this going to school, good for you. <laughs> good job. Any age is a good age to go back to school. Yeah. Um, or to learn uh, a mm -hmm. new uh, career or, or passion. Mm -hmm like that just goes to like the the, the economic and the, the housing uh situation we, we call it a crisis but people don't really understand what that means like crisis it, it really means that every so many people are on the edge of homelessness or are homeless now because mm -hmm. of circumstances beyond their control mm -hmm. we can control these things like it's not a choice that we made um that our kids have a disability or that we have a disability um it's not our choice that we are no longer with our partner. Should we mm -hmm. be with our partner if like, say they're abusive or it's not working out? Like, <laughs> right? Like it, it, it just, it seems like this is how we, we want, uh, it, society kind of wants us to be in this little box, right? And so when we demand better for housing and things like that, they're like, well, why didn't you get a better job or, you know, do all this stuff? And it's like, do you understand the complexities of life that can, put us in these situations that it's not, it's not any of our, our, our fault. You're keeping your child safe. Um, they're, they're loved. Uh, you are totally committed to working or to furthering, to bettering yourself, right? Like we, I think we need to kind of stray away from the whole, uh, productive, uh, I'm working, so I'm better, you know, any kind of thing. Uh, there's a great article I read about it that, uh, productive, productivity doesn't mean you're a better human you know um i think that we need to honor every human for who they are and what they're where they're at in their lives um mm -hmm. i'm going on an, off on a tangent but it's just i find it so frustrating um i have friends who are going through it right now looking for a home it's been six months and i just i can't imagine what it's like uh to also have to walk into that situation where I am indigenous as well, where I've had to face racism on a daily basis and, uh, you know, ask for a place to stay and for, have, for them to trust me and stuff that all those biases that come into play. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Ramona. And you know what, though, we're getting that voice out there. We're getting these stories out there. And that, that is uh, key. And uh, I encourage everyone to actually write their MLAs about this. Uh, this is not a, um, you know, um, a one-off issue or anything like that. This is an embedded uh, systemic problem within our system that we really need to address now because we're at crisis point. So, yeah. So I ask all our our, our audience to, to do that. Ask questions, ask your MLAs, ask your city councilors, what are you doing to help with this housing crisis? Like, what are you doing specifically? Because municipalities can do stuff as well. They can. And they can't keep waiting for the province to uh, to kind of come up with solutions. They need to come up with solutions themselves. 
Yeah. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you so much.